the lives of millions of Ghanaians. So basically, these are my motivations for undertaking the research. Now, um, Dean, what is my argument? What, what do I seek to say at the end of the paper? Number one, I'm arguing that there is no word in Arabic for adultery separate from fornication. And therefore, there cannot be a penalty for that which does not exist. That's all. The word for illicit sex in Arabic is zina. Finish. The, the word fornication, the distinction of fornication and adultery is not known to the Arabic language. And therefore, my argument is that that which does not exist cannot have a penalty for it. That's number one. Number two, I am arguing that the punishment for those who engage in illicit sex in Islam is a hundred lashes of the ship, as stated in Quran 42.2. So that one is explicit. As for the fornicator and the fornicatress, adulterer and adulteress, you shall flog them a hundred lashes and let not pity take hold of you and let the punishment be witnessed by other believers. That is explicitly so stated. And I agree that that explicit statement is what it is. The third one says that those who argue for stoning as punishment for adultery derive their authority from what Muslims call the hadiths. And the hadith is basically the second source of law in Islam. And we will come um, to that. I am also arguing that, therefore, such authority is null and void because it contradicts the explicit provision of the Quran. And I will argue later that any law in Islam which is inconsistent with the Quran is to the extent of such inconsistency null and void. The other argument I'm making is that the threshold for establishing adultery is too high to meet. And Quran 24, 4 to 5 says that those who accuse others of unchastity or of adultery must produce four witnesses to support their position. I don't know how many people ever in their lifetime will witness any such act by two people. I'm also arguing that the hadiths on stoning fail the test of logical consistency when examined against the principles of hadith criticism. And there's the whole science of what we call the science of hadith criticism, which tells us the criteria for distinguishing genuine from false hadith. I'm saying that the hadith on stoning, when we examine them against the principles of hadith criticism, they fail. Finally, that, the rep that repentance and forgiveness by Allah is the ultimate restitution for zina, not death. So to repent or to die, I am saying to repent, not to die. That's the argument that I have come here to make. Now, I talked about Islam as both religion and state. And I said that there are, a, there are principles that govern the Islamic nation. And these principles are what people generally call the Sharia. Okay? So, Sharia is not just penal. It's not the penal code of Islam, but it's the entire gamut, social, political, economic, everything that encapsulates the governance of an Islamic state. But normally when people hear Sharia, then they are panicking because they understand that it is the cutting of hands and stoning people to death. <laughs> but Sharia is way more than that. And like I'm saying, um, Sharia means a way to a watering place, literally. And that watering place is Allah. I mean, the, or the word of Allah, which is basically the Quran. And therefore, the Quran and its other derivatives. I will explain those derivatives. Now, I derive the sources of law from Quran chapter 4, verse 59. And it says, and I quote, Obey Allah and obey the messenger. So I have underlined Allah, the first source of law, the messenger, the second source of law, and those in authority amongst you. I've underlined those in authority. Then it says, however, if you differ still amongst yourselves, refer it back to Allah and his messenger. It is called analogical deduction or kiyas. 
and I would explain that in the next slides. But let me deal with the Quran. Now, the Quran is the literal word. I mean, you don't need to believe it if you are not a Muslim. I'm just telling you what the Muslims believe. Whether that is true or not, that's not my business right now. So, but the Muslims believe that the Quran is the literal word, and I mean literal word of Allah, dictated verbatim through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam over a period of 22 years from 610 to 632 common era. Now, the Quran itself gives or outlines its major characteristics. The things that hold the Quran sacrosanct or different from other religious books. And what is it? One, that in the Quran, there is no doubt. For those who have been to Arabic school, that's what they mean by Alif Lamim. That there is absolutely no doubt. A, a guidance for the mutakin. So in the Quran, there is no doubt. So no element or shade of opinion from anywhere should cast doubt on the principles of the Quran. That's number one. Number two, that the prophet, the only law that governed the prophet's life is the Quran. So says the Quran itself in Quran 2285. The, the, again, they render it in Arabic as Aman Rasulu Bima Unzila Irehi. Aman Rasulu. The prophet, he follows it. Verbeti. Two, that nothing has been left out of the Quran, that it is a complete book. There was no moment when Allah or the prophet forgot to include that which should have been included. And that's what they render in Arabic like as. Uh, nothing has been left out of the book. And then Quran 482 also challenges the world and says, it actually says, and I quote, that have you pondered over the Quran? If it was from any other, other than Allah, you would have found in it much contradiction or discrepancy. So Muslims believe that there is not a, an, an iota of contradiction in the Quran. And then last one, that it was already on a preserved tablet. They call it Lawhul Mahfuz in the, in the seven heavens. And then from there, it was revealed piecemeal to the prophet. So these are the sacrosanct beliefs of Muslims about the Quran. And I'm saying therefore that when you put all of these together, then any law that is inconsistent with the Quran will therefore, to the extent of such inconsistency, be null and void. Now we come to hadith. Hadith basically means the sayings or practices of the prophet, even to some extent his companions. Because this um, hadith that we are going to examine, which some people like the Taliban and the Sharia courts in northern Nigeria based on to say that um, the punishment for adultery in Islam is stoning to death. It's not actually even attributed to the Prophet, but to Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was the second caliph of Islam. In other words, the leader of the Muslim Ummah after the death of the Prophet. But it connotes something new and means something like a news item, a tale, or a story, or a report. So, a typical hadith will go like on the authority of Umar ibn al Khattab, who said that he heard Ali bin Abu Talib saying that the Prophet said so, so, and so, and so, and so, and so, and then it goes on. Now, hadith is in three forms. There's what they call kaul, fi'l, and takrir. Kaul means the type of hadith where it is said that somebody says, I heard the Prophet say. So the actual sayings of the prophet is called. Now, fail is when a hadith says that I saw the prophet doing so, so, and so. And then takrir is his tacit approval. 
So somebody will say, uh, one day we were sitting with the prophet, and somebody put an amulet around his neck and came around the prophet, and the prophet said nothing. So to the extent that the prophet did not chastise the person for wearing an amulet, then it means that the wearing of amulets is acceptable. It's called tacit approval. You, you, you see something, and then you, do not, you don't say or oppose it. They call it tacit, tacit approval. Okay? Now, hadith itself has been categorized into four. They call something the sahihi, hasan, da'if, and maudu. And I have put, it, put the English renditions in brackets. So hey, sahihi is supposed to be of excellent quality. Hassan means it's sound, it's okay, we can work with it. Da'if means it's of doubtful authenticity. And then fabricated. Maudu hadith, uh, you can look at it and say, this hadith is fabricated, the prophet never said this. And then you dismiss it. It's, it's called Maudu. Now, when you take a piece of hadith, it is made up of two parts. What we call the isnad and the matan. The isnad meaning the chain of narrators. And the matan, the content of the hadith itself okay so when i say that on the authority of aisha who said that ibn abbas told her that ali ibn abu talib said that the prophet said that so so and so and so or maybe for example um, break your fast when it is nightfall okay so aisha omar ali are the chain of narrators that the isnad and then break your fast when it is nightfall is the content of the hadith. So we do an analysis of both the content and the, and the chain of narrators in order to decide whether the hadith is of doubtful authenticity or it is likely to be sound. Now, under the signs of criticism, like I said, um, they tell us that a hadith must pass all of this criteria before we can accept its authenticity. So they say that, first of all, there must be other supporting hadiths. Okay? It, it cannot be a lone hadith. Just a lone one. A lone hadith, there are lone hadiths, but they don't place much. They say they are of weak authenticity, unless, of course, they are supported by... So the preponderance of, of a hadith is basically a measure of its authenticity. Now, the reliability of the narrators themselves. So we scrutinize the persons who are telling us the story about the prophet. Were they people of integrity? The way you guys do it in the courts, when you are cross-work or examining a witness, you want to be able to dent their credibility. And therefore, <laughs> whatever they have said would, would not be considered as weighty by the judge. So we look at the reliability of, of narrators. I mean, there are many, many companions who committed so many crimes, who were punished by the prophet, and etc., etc. And they have hadiths. So people will look at them, their character, and so on, and say, this guy, he was accused of, of kazaf, of lying against chaste people. Therefore, his hadiths cannot be accepted. Now, the continuity of the chain of narrators. We also examine the, the narrators and see whether they lived within the same geographical entity what was the possibility that they actually met? And that the possibility that this man must have told this person that. I don't know whether you get the point that I'm trying to make. So, um, I haven't seen my sister Humu Seni for perhaps God knows how many years. So, if suddenly I die, and then somebody comes to say, I heard Humu Seni say that Mustafa Hamid told her that this town is doubtful. <laughs> you get my point. How close were you to Mustafa Hamid that he will be telling you things? Basically, that's the point that I'm trying to make. Now, the consistency with the Quran, I've already established that. Any hadith that is inconsistent or contradicts an explicit provision of the Quran is unacceptable, straight away. That it stands the test of logic and sound reasoning. I, I, are you following me? That the hadith is not outrageously illogical. Now, last one, whether it is supported by established history. All right, now let's move on. The last two sources, so I've done Quran, I've done Hadith. The third source is what we call Ijma. Ijma means the consensus of the scholars. And 
it comes from the word jam. Jam means together. So consensus of, of, a, of scholars. Actually, even of scholars of a particular geographical area. So when you hear all these um, five schools of Islamic law, Hanafi, Maliki, uh, Hanbali, Shafi'i, these were all, they are a gathering of the consensus of the opinions of the majority of scholars within a geographical area. But now, the, the leading scholar of that town headlines the school of thought, basically. Okay, so the Maliki school of thought, for example, was the leading opinions around Medina, the Madinan school, basically, that's what it is. And then um, you will have the Shafi'i being the Makan school. And then you would have the Hanafi being the Kufan Iraqi school. And uh, another one being Egyptian and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what it is. So it's just a consensus of scholars. So the process of exerting yourself to formulate Islamic principles is called ijtihad. And those who qualify to do so are called mujtahids. Now, kiyas. Kiyas is loosely translated as analogical deduction. Remember, I told you Quran 4, um, 59 says that, let me go back to it, let it show, and then I'll make the point. It says, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority amongst you. If you differ in anything amongst yourselves, refer it to Allah and his messengers. So the referring back to Allah and his messenger is that if you are confronted with a novel situation, with a situation that is not explicit in the Quran and is not explicit in the, in the Sunnah, what a scholar is supposed to do is to go and take some cases or issues in the Quran or the, or the Hadith that are similar to the situation that has arisen. And then you put all of it together in order to arrive at a new ruling. So it's basically almost like case law. You know, the way judges will say that in Indonesia in 1956, so-so and so happened, and this is what the Indonesians said. So on the basis of that, I think that this is it, and so on and so forth. So that's why I call it the process of deductive analogy, in which the teachings of the Quran and Hadith are compared and contrasted in order to apply a known injunction to a new circumstance, in order to create a new injunction. You know, it looks like convoluted language, but it makes sense. Now, in the Islamic penal system, we have a broad division of what I can loosely translate as felonies or felonies and misdemeanors. Okay? The felonies are what the Muslims or scholars call hudud. Okay? Hudud crimes. One is had, and plural are hudud. So hudud crimes are the crimes that are generally considered as felonies and whose punishments are explicitly stated in the Quran. And I have mentioned them here. Theft, that if you steal, your hands should be cut. Um, that those who wage war against Allah and his apostle. Now, that's quite a nebulous law. It's almost like causing financial laws to the state. And in the history of Islam, Many Sharia judges have decided for themselves what constitutes waging war against Allah and his messenger, including the execution of the famous Sufi saint, Mansur, um, Hussein bin Mansur, otherwise known as Al-Halaj. You know when um, the dean was introducing me, he said one of the articles that I have written is titled Islam and the Charge of Blasphemy religious language and the charge of blasphemy in defense of Al-Halaj. This Halaj guy was executed in 922 common era in Baghdad because he pronounced, he said the statement, An al-Haq, I am the truth. And the authorities in Baghdad determined that it was waging war against Allah and his messenger because he had said that he was another god. So he had committed the sin of associationism, shirk. Associating because only Allah is the truth. Only one of Allah's names is Al Haq. So for you to say An Al Haq, you are basically declaring war against the unity of Allah. And they, they hanged him. After that, they took down his body, dismembered it, 
burnt it and, th and threw his ashes into the Euphrates River. So it's quite a nebulous law. I can decide what constitutes waging war, just as Boko Haram is doing, you know, saying that the fact that Buhari is practicing democracy uh, makes him a kafir. Because, therefore, once he's a kafir, then he's a legitimate target for execution. <laughs> you know, anyway, so let's move on. So there's illicit sexual intercourse. There's false accusation of unchastity. And I have told you that this verse says that if you false, those who falsely accuse others of having committed sexual indiscretion, they shall be caned at 80 lashes. And thereafter, their testimony shall never be taken in any serious arena. Then there's murder, kisses. And then there is manslaughter. So the punishments are all stated. The punishment for murder is there, and then the punishment for manslaughter. Now, apart from felony, we have what we call tazir. So tazir, etymologically, is derived from the verb azar, which means to prevent or to reform. So basically, they are the punishments that are meant to reform you. You know, so they, they generally are said to apply to misdemeanors. Now, for those who say, now, first of all, I want to articulate the arguments, the source of law for those who say that the punishment for stoning, sorry, for adultery is stoning to death. And this is where they derive their authority. Number one, they say that the prophet carried out the punishment of stoning adulterers to death because Umar ibn Hattab, says that there was a verse of the Quran called Ayat al Rajab. The word Ayah in Arabic means a verse. Ayat al Rajab, the Ayah of stoning. That it was actually revealed, but that somehow it has not found space in the Quran. And Umar is alleged to have said this at a Friday sermon in Medina. And therefore said that I am afraid that after I am dead, you Muslims will, will, will cease to, to stone adulterers to death because you will say that you haven't found it in the Quran. In, in other means, he's saying that when he's dead, people like Mustafa Hamid will come and say that <laughs> the thing is not in the So he's saying it so that you know that the ayah was there before, but even though it is no longer in the Quran, but its, uh, um, its effect is applicable. That's what Umar is alleged. And this is found in Buhari, book 82, Hadiths 816 and Hadiths 817. Now, I need you to know what this Buhari is. You know, the Muslims have determined that there are certain six books, they call them the Sihah Sitta, six collections of Hadiths, which are of valid canonical authenticity. Okay, so Buhari is number one. Muslim is there. Sunan Abu Dawood, Ko, the Sunan Abu Dawood, there's Tirmizi, right? There's Ibn Majah, and there's one other I would remember presently. But six, six books, they call them Sihar Husita. And among the six, Buhari is supposed to be the most canonical, the most canonical amongst the canonical, basically. And so that's why I'm taking all the arguments from Buhari. Now, in Buhari also, they say that the prophet meted out the punishment of stoning to a Jewish man and a Jewish woman in accordance with Old Testament law. Because the hadith says that two people were brought to the prophet. Remember I told you that in Medina, the population was made up of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, with the prophet as the head of the, the, the Medinan community. So they brought two, according to this hadith, not me, they brought a man, a Jewish man, and a Jewish woman, and they, they said that they had engaged in adultery. And the prophet said, what is their religion? And they said, they are Jews. And he said, bring the Torah, which means the Old Testament, and let's see what the Old Testament says about adultery. And of course, the Christians here know that it is in Leviticus. It is stated in, the, in Leviticus. I don't know which chapter and verse, but it's in Leviticus. Somebody can Google it now. Um, in Leviticus, it says that adulteress should be stoned to death. And that when they read it to the prophet, that that was the stipulation of the Old Testament. He said, 
according to the Madinan Charter, I think Article 24 or 25, says that Jews, Christians, and Muslims shall be punished according to their scriptures. In other words, in the Madinan community, if you were a Muslim and you committed an aberration, you will be punished according to Quranic law. So according to this, because they were Jews, they had to be punished according to Jewish law. They also say that there, there's an incident also reported in Buhari that a man came to the prophet and confessed to adultery. He himself came and said, I have committed adultery, so punish me. And then the prophet said that they should take him and go and stone him to death. So they took him and stoned him to death. A man also reported that a man came to report his son that his son had committed, had had sexual intercourse with a married woman. So the prophet said, as for your son, because he's not married, we shall give him a hundred lashes of the whip. But as for the woman, because she was married, they should take her away and then stone her to death, which according to the hadith was done. Then there is this other hadith in which Abdullah bin Abi Alpha asserts that the prophet carried out the punishment of stoning to death. And as Shaybani questions him and said, Abdullah bin Abi Alpha, if you say that the prophet carried out the stoning to death, did he carry it out before the verse of punishment for zina was revealed or after? And according to this hadith, Abi Alpha said, I do not know. If it was in a court of law, then I would have said to Abi Alpha, I am therefore suggesting to you that it was before the revelation of the explicit verses of the Quran on the punishment for Zida. But it's not in a court of law, it's an academic environment. So let's go on, we'll see. Now, I have already said that the explicit punishment for Zina in Islam is a hundred lashes of the hip. So for the avoidance of doubt, I have put the verse here. And for those who have a Quran on their phones, you can check. It says, the woman, Azaniyatu, in other words, the woman who commits zina, and Wazani, and the man who commits zina. And if you read all the translations of the Quran, they actually say, the man and the woman who commit fornication and adultery. The same translators who are saying that we should stone the, to death have translated zina to mean both fornication and adultery. That you shall give them a hundred stripes and let not pity for them detain you in the matter of obedience to Allah. If you believe in Allah and the last day and let a party of believers witness their chastisement. Now, this is what it says. So I'm going to now give a justification for my argument. Earlier on, I had told you what my arguments are. I'm going to now try to justify why I believe that it's a hundred lashes and thereafter repentance, not death. One, there is only one Arabic word for illicit sex, zina. I've already made that argument, that there is no word for adultery in Arabic. Secondly, that the punishment for a slave shall be half that of a free person. I made that argument in the story that I gave. So I'm asking, if we agree that the punishment for adultery in Islam is stoning to death of free persons, when it comes to a slave, how are we going to administer half of stoning to death? So I am suggesting that because Allah knows that he has already stated that the punishment for adultery is a hundred lashes. When it comes to the free person, he doesn't need to state a figure. So when he says half, then you know that it's 50 lashes of the hip. So I'm suggesting that even the existence of this verse in the Quran, Quran 425, suggests that it cannot be stoning to death. Because stoning to death is problematic. And if what my friend said in 209 is anything to go by, that uh, it is there, but uh, half should be discretionary. I'm not sure that we can decide today that half of 10 should be discretionary. So I can decide that half of 10 is 6. <laughs> it cannot be. Half is half. Now, thirdly, the argument about an ayat or rajim violates or nullifies the argument about the sanctity of the Quran. 
You see, because if they are saying that Umar said that there was the ayah, that the verse was there, it was revealed, but somehow it's missing from the Quran. Then the whole argument that Muslims are making that the Quran was already in a complete form on a preserved tablet, lawhul mahfuz, and was revealed piecemeal, that whole argument is shattered. It means that it's no longer true that the Quran is, sanct has, is, is sanctimonious or, or, or that there's some sanctity around the Quran. And I want to vouch for the sanctity of the Quran rather than the authenticity of this hadith. So I am saying that the Quran was indeed on lawhul mahfuz, that it is sacrosanct, that ma faratna fi kitabi min shayin is correct, nothing has been left out of the Quran, and therefore there was no ayat of rajim. Then, there is an explicit verse of the Quran that also says, la hukum illa lillah. There is no judgment except that of Allah. Okay? And the judgment of Allah on adultery is clear. It's a hundred lashes. So any other judgment inconsistent with Allah's judgment according to this Quranic ayah is null and void. That's my argument also. Now, the main content of the hadith attributed to Umar on the authority of Ibn Abbas does not stand scrutiny according to the principles of hadith criticism. Why? One, the hadith lacks logical consistency. I'll tell you why it lacks logical consistency. For those who know that the hadith is one of the very longest hadiths in, the, in Buhari. It is said that it was during Hajj and Umar had come from Medina to perform the Hajj in Makkah. And then somebody met him, I think they said Abdurrahman bin Auf, and said to him that the people of Medina are saying that the election of Abu Bakr to the caliphate was irregular and that when you are dead, they will make Sa'ad bin Abu uh, Ubada the caliph and something to that effect about the caliphate. So Umar got upset and said, I will go back to Medina now. I will cut short my hajj, go back to Medina and correct that impression. So Abdurrahman said to him, don't. You finish the hajj. When you go and you want to lead the Friday sermon, then you can correct that impression. So he goes to the Friday prayer after hajj, and then in the pulpit, he begins to address the question of leadership. Then all of a sudden, he veers off and also says, yeah, but I'm afraid also that when I die, people will say that there was no ayah to rajam, and then they will not be carrying out the punishment of stoning. So I want you to know that there was an ayah to rajam, even though it is no longer in the Quran, but please practice it. Really and truly, I'm not sure that khutbas are so disjointed and unrelated as far as subject matter is concerned. To the extent that the subject matter for that day was on leadership, it is not possible that Umar would have brought in the subject of a verse that previously existed in the Quran. Now, the words that Umar, this hadith, says that Umar used to mean adulterer and adulteress is shaykhu wa shaykha. That Umar said, as for the shaykhu and the shaykha, stone them. But really, um, there are some Arabic scholars who have come to listen to me. By which stretch of imagination can sheikh mean adulterer? Because a sheikh is basically like a leader, a head, a clan head. If we were to say that it even means adulterer, is it all leaders and clan heads who are married? <laughs> of course not. So sheikh was sheikh which they say is the word that Omar used to mean adulterer, is very problematic and does not stand the test of logic. Now, in some other books of jurisprudence, those who say that we should stone adulterers to death, the words that they use for a married person and therefore an adulterer and adulteress is moswan. And then they say gairo moswan. <laughs> okay? Married and not married. But again, the Arabic scholars are, are here. A Mohsan simply means a chaste person, a clean person. It's not all chaste people who are married also. So again, if we use Mohsan to mean adulterer, it doesn't work according to the logic of grammar. So whether they say Sheikhu or Mohsan or whatever, 
So I put in my own statement and I said, it will seem therefore that there's, there's an attempt to invent a word for adultery in Arabic by all means. But I'm saying that so far, those attempts have been unsuccessful. Now, the stoning of the, Jews, the Jewish man and Jewish woman, I do not know whether it happened. But if indeed it even happened, then it happened according to the principles of their faith. Because as I said, it's in Leviticus. It's not in the Quran. And of course, they were Jews. And as I said, Article 25 of the Madinan Charter was clear that people who violate laws or commit crimes shall be punished according to the principles of their faith. So there's no way we can transpose a Jewish injunction or an Old Testament injunction onto the Quran. No. Now, secondly, no, no hadith justifying stoning has ever named a person who was so stoned to death. If you read all the hadiths on stoning, they just say a man, a woman, a woman was stoned. But I guess that people have had names since the creation of Adam. Indeed, Adam himself had a name. And so thereafter, everybody has had a name. There is not a single named person in these hadiths who was stoned to death. And I, I doubt that. So, because there are hadiths that are re replicit with names of people that Abu Fudail came to the prophet and said, counsel me. And the prophet said, uh, play, pray, uh, he said, I am busy and I'm unable to say the five daily prayers. And then the prophet said, um, play al asrain and he said, what is al asrain And he said, it is to combine the Zuhur and the Asr prayers. So people are named in hadiths in connection with their encounters with the prophet. How come that on stoning alone, nobody is ever named? I just have my doubts. I'm just asking questions. My professor Gaba used to say, I don't want an answer. <laughs> now, as Shaybani's question to Abdullah ibn Alpha is germane, and I'm suggesting that even if the prophet carried out the punishment of stoning, it must have been before the revelation of Quran 24 verse 2. Even if he did. I'm not saying he did. Kokubaku calls it what? Assuming without admitting. Let's assume that he did. It must have been before. Because you remember that when the prophet migrated to Medina, there were many practices of the Jewish people which he adopted and asked the Muslims to do, including even facing Jerusalem to pray until a specific verse came and said, turn your face towards the Qibla, and then the Muslims turned, including fasting on Ashura, which the Jews used to do on the, the, the day of Passover. And then the, 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 the revelation on Ramadan came, and then they stopped the Passover fasting. So I'm suggesting that perhaps because of these Jewish practices that he was doing, he must have carried it out. But after an explicit verse of the Quran is revealed, he must have stopped it. Now, I am coming to the character of the prophet himself. And I'm saying that by the character of the prophet that is written in the Quran, he could not have been stoning Muslims to death. The people that he had labored and suffered for, suffered persecution in order to preach the faith and for them to abandon the polytheistic belief and troop to Islam, then he turns around and he stones them to death. I think that the character that Allah portrays of his prophet in the Quran is inconsistent with such callous behavior. This verse says, now has come to you an apostle from amongst yourselves. It grieves him. That, listen, that Allah says it grieves the prophet. The prophet grieves that Muslims should perish. He's stoning to death, not perishing. That it grieves him that Muslims should perish. And that he's ardently desirous of Muslims. He's anxious about Muslims. He likes Muslims. And to the Muslims, he's most kind and most merciful. I am arguing that a very merciful and kind prophet towards Muslims would hardly stone them to death. Another one. This is a hadith. No, I'll come to the hadith later. This is Quran 40, 48, 29. It says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the apostle of Allah. And those who are with him, Muhammad Rasulullah ashidaw al-kufari, are strong against the unbelievers. 
but they are compassionate amongst one another. The Muslims, they have compassion for themselves. Again, I'm arguing that having compassion for your fellow Muslim is not stoning him to death. Now, there's a hadith also in the same Buhari in which another man, again, not named, <laughs> comes to the prophet and says, um, oh, I'm talking about the Umar one yet. I'll come to the man. But Umar, there's a hadith in Buhari in which the prophet was sharing war booty. And a man got up and told the prophet, be just, be just in your sharing of the war booty. Don't be unjust. And then Umar rushed to pounce on the man. And the prophet held him and said, let it not be said that Muhammad kills his people. It's in Buhari. I'm saying that let, not it, let it not be said that Muhammad was killing his people. Stoning to death is killing his people. So if he has said in the same Buhari, so that means that even in the Buhari, we've seen the contradictions and the inconsistencies. Those inconsistencies don't exist in the Quran. So if I'm going to wager, I will wager in favor of the Quran, not, not Buhari. The, pro the prophet telling a man that the punishment for his hard crime had been forgiven. Remember, I told you that hudud crimes are crimes whose punishments are explicitly stated in the Quran. In this same Buhari, in book 86, number 6823, a man comes to the prophet during Asr prayer and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed a felony, a hard crime, even though he doesn't mention the crime. So inflict the punishment on me, because Allah says in the Quran, the punishment should be inflicted. And the prophet said, let's pray first. So they go into the mosque, they finish the Asr prayer, and then they come out. And the man goes to the prophet again and says, Ya Rasulullah, I want the punishment inflicted on me. And then the, according to the hadith, the prophet said, did you not just pray Asr with us? And the man said, yes. And the prophet said, you have been forgiven. I wager that the prophet was on the side of forgiveness, not killing the Muslims. So conclusion, my clear position is that punishment for adultery in Islam is a hundred lashes of the hip, not stoning to death. There are many mujtahids who hold the same view. In other words, I'm not saying that I'm saying anything that is new. There are many people who hold that view as well, including the entire Ahmadiyya fraternity. Indeed, the Ahmadis have been at pains to keep writing and keep writing. I remember the late uh, Molvi Wahab Adam, the head of the Ahmadiyya fraternity in Ghana, may Allah bless his soul, um, wrote copiously in the press in Ghana, asking any Muslims who have real and impeachable evidence that the prophet was killing Muslims by stoning them to death to come forward. Until he died, I am not sure that I saw any rebuttal of his position. So I'm not saying anything new. But as scholars, they would always ask you after you have made your presentation. So Allah said inherently the act itself is wrong, thereby prohibited as opposed to um, the prohibition of that act is what makes it um, wrong. And I think zina, um, illicit sex, uh, falls within the mala inse um, type of crimes because it's inherently wrong, sort of. Um, and, and that's just something that went through my mind. But if we can go to slide 11, and I'll go there for you. Um, because I have a question on that. Yes. 11 was on um, punishment in Islamic um, law, where you talked about the had and hadud, and, and, and you list them as the felonies whose punishments are explicitly provided in the Quran. My, my question to you is that on the basis of, of this, um, 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 the, 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 the list of offenses that the punishment are clearly provided, is there a uniform standard of proof for instance, for these offenses which have been outlined in the Quran? And if so, how does that standard of proof um, in these offenses, how do you juxtapose them to, say, the standard of proof of beyond reasonable doubt in criminal um, um, offenses as applicable in Ghana? So that will be my first question um, to you before we open the floor um, for other questions as well. 
You can turn on the mic. Yeah. Okay. So, like I have said, um, there are four sources of law in Islam. The Quran. And the Quran has the provisions, the stipulations of these prohibitions and the consequences thereof. Okay? Then, in the practices and life of the Prophet, okay, there are written accounts of how he dealt with these matters. Okay? And from those body of collections, the jurists, is what the jurists have classified into Hanafi law, Maliki law, Shafi'i law, and etc., etc. So the, the standards of proof, yes, they do exist, but they differ from one school of law to the other. So you will find that they may tell you that, for example, Saudi Arabia practices Hanbali law mm. or Hanbali law, okay? Um, or they may say to you that Iran, for example, practices Jafari law. Mm. And for something that um, Jafari law may say um, should be for a period of, say, two years, uh, Hanbali law could say three years, and et cetera, et cetera. So there will definitely be standards of proof, um, except, of course, like I said, in some of the, mm. the nebulous laws like waging war mm -hmm. against Allah and his messenger and so on. But in the Quran, for, for the purpose of zina, which is what we are discussing mm -hmm. today, it says that the standard of proof is that you must bring four people who witnessed the event. And that if it is not, if, if you, you come to say it by yourself, that this is what I have done, and you don't bring four witnesses, then you yourself should testify four times against yourself that what I say be true. Do you get the point? So there are standards of proof, but they differ from school of law to school of law. Mm. There's no uniform standard of proof. Mm. All right. Um, so, so murder, for instance, yeah. what will be the requirements? You say, Zina, you need four witnesses. What will be the, the, the standard that you need to well, establish? Well, murder also, there will be um, almost like um, the same elements that you have in secular law, mm. that first of all, there is a body. Um, if there is no body, and there is, I'll give a very typical example that happened in the international media very recently. If there is no body, but there's conclusive proof that nonetheless the person died, yeah. that um, there were perpetrators, mm. you, you, you get the point. Um, that would be a standard proof, that mm. a, a, a body conclusively that the person is dead. Mm. Um, and there's circumstantial evidence that links somebody the else to the, to, to the mm. death of the person. So a typical example is what I said made headline news in the world was the death of the journalist Hashogji. Mm. Mm. To this day, we don't have the Hashogji's body. The Turkish embassy. Yes, in the, the Saudi embassy, Saudi in, embassy Turkey. Yeah, in Turkey. Okay, yeah. but we, we, we have concluded that he indeed died and was killed by agents of the Saudi government. That is why the Saudi government has proceeded to pay what the Muslims call dia, blood money, to Hashogji's son, because they, they have accepted, uh, they, they think they are, the Saudi state is somehow culpable oh. because it happened in their embassy and et cetera, et cetera. So those would be uh, some of the proofs for men. All right, um, thank you very much. So we'll open the floor now um, for questions. Um, and I see a question here, um, the microphone will be brought to you. So if you can mention your name, I, I know the first one, but he should still mention his name um, before he asks this question. Um, is it working?
Absolutely. <laughs> Do you, do you want to take it one by one, or or we should we should have a few, a few more questions? Okay, so there's a question here. Yes. <laughs> it's got mood score sessions here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, my lord. I, I saw <laughs> that was Justice Isifu Omoro Tanko Amadu, a Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana, who has joined us. So, Honorable, over to you. You have three questions um, to answer. The man, I, you remember, I, I admitted that your question is a difficult one. Okay, so my difficulty with answering your question is that, yes, um, it's, it's not in consonance with human rights, okay, to lash people. But that's how you call it, human rights, okay? But in a Sharia court, they will be dealing with, with rights that belong to God. Because oftentimes in the Quran, Allah makes statements and say, these are the limits of Allah and do not cross them. I, 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 are you following me? So the rights that you are talking about, so it's, it's according to um, Islamic jurisprudence, the act of zina, okay, violates the, the sanctity, okay, that God himself has placed around the sexual act, okay? And for that violation, you should be punished. I don't know whether um, to say that it is okay to do that. But I'm just saying that 
if it is in a Sharia court where they say we are implementing God's law, and you know in, in, in many of these countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, and so on, they say that the fundamental law of the land is the Quran, and all other principles of governance emanate from the Quran. Okay, so for them, your, your human rights and so on do not matter to them. But in a secular society like ours, of course, um, it will be an aberration for anybody to be caned for engaging in what we ordinarily would call a sin and not a crime. Because the statutes of Ghana are the constitution, the 1992. And as for interpretation, I have always said that there is no objective interpretation anywhere. Every interpreter approaches a text with his or her own subjectivities. There is no objective interpretation anywhere in the world. Yeah. Now, secondly, which people are authorized to execute this punishment? So, of course, that is why, you know, that is why people say that um, the concept that Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda and the rest are bandying about uh, regarding their so-called understanding of jihad. Um, people argue that the time for the promulgation of jihad is past because there's no central Islamic authority qualified to declare jihad. There's no such central authority. That is the argument. Because it was part of the ingredients for which uh, jihad ought to be declared. That there must be a central and acceptable authority. So if the people determine for themselves that the Quran, they are going to be ruled by the Quranic principles, as in, say, Iran or Saudi Arabia or in Afghanistan, the Afghan authorities, remember I've told you that the prophet was at once the head of state, chief justice, army commander, all of that. So the Afghan authorities themselves, the Sharia courts that they have set out, will be the ones which will be responsible for judging this matter. Even in the case of Amina Lawal of Katsina, which I, I, I gave, it was the Sharia court in Katsina that determined that she should be stoned um, to death. And then um, you said also that if it is not carried out, then what happens? So remember, my topic says to repent or to die. And I have said that well, not me, but in Islam, every sin is forgivable except the sin of shirk. Okay? And therefore, um, if the hadith that I quoted is anything to go by where the prophet said to the man, did you not just pray asr? And then the man said, yes, I prayed asr with you. He said, Allah will forgive you. And so, um, we are told that Allah says that his mercy encompasses his wrath. And therefore, I believe that even if it were not carried out, Allah will forgive. Now, will cameras suffice as witness? Of course, they will survive, Justice Tanku. I'm very, uh, uh, my lord. Um, cameras will suffice as evidence. Remember that in this modern day, uh, people even have um, science has made it possible for Muslims to sight the moon using telescopic um, evidence, if you want, that there are powerful cameras that are able to penetrate the stratosphere or whatever name they call it in order to determine that the moon has appeared, even though we cannot see it with our naked eye. And Muslims accept that verdict and then they go on and fast. So to that extent, science would be um, enough evidence. I remember some time ago there was this viral, not just one actually, these viral videos of a young man in Tamale who was recording every sexual ep escapade that he had with all the multiple girls in a university for development studies. And the videos were all over the place. And I remember telling my wife, I said, as for this guy, on the day of judgment, Allah will not need to ask him any questions. Allah will present the videos to him and say, are you the one in these videos? The, the videos will be self-evident. 
you know, I, I remember making that joke when the videos were all over the place. So, to that extent, my Lord, I agree with you that um, cameras will, will suffice as evidence. Because remember, my argument was that the threshold for that, uh, for proving adultery is too high. Four witnesses, I'm not sure we will ever get there. Unless, of course, God meant to just say, it is not your matter. Leave it. Because you can never meet the, sh the threshold anyway. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so let's take another round of questions, um, starting from the back and then we'll come here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for insightful discussion. What's your name? My name is Kenneth E.G. Um, my question has to do with um, discretion. You mentioned that every offense is forgivable. Islam. Except for one offense. And, and in criminal law, that would seem to suggest some discretion of the court and option to give. What would be the situation to assess that this is a case where we should forgive? And this is one that this is a case where we should improve. So my question borders on the considerations for that forgiveness, if that imply discretion and exercises that discretion. Uh, such a case, but I believe the Sharia court. Thank you very much. I think there was another hand um, here, and then there's one at the front. No, oh, there are two at the front here. Yeah. More question and then Um, we'll take these four questions and we'll come for the last round where there will just be um, a few questions and then we'll wrap up. So, um, um, on the question of who forgives, I will read you the one on murder. Okay, I will read the Quranic stipulation verbatim. Okay, and it says, Oh, you who believe, which means Muslims, the law of equality is prescribed to you in cases of murder. The free for the free, the free for the free, the slave for the slave, 
the woman for the woman. But if any remission is made by the brother of the slain, or as the, it has been interpreted, the relative of the slain, then grant, then grant any reasonable demand and compensate him with handsome gratitude. This is a concession and a mercy from your Lord. So what happens is that when somebody, when the case travels and the judge comes to the conclusion that indeed there was a case of murder, normally at the, at the verdict, I don't know how you, you lawyers call it, the, the day that the judgment is being pronounced, relatives of the dead man or woman is, are supposed to be in court. And when the sentence has been passed, they are asked, according to this verse, whether this man is supposed to die because he killed your relative. For me, as the judge, I'm supposed to pass the sentence. But it is left to you to decide whether he should die or not. And if the relatives say he, um, you should be set free, normally that's when, as I said, they pay, they pay you what they call dia or blood money in lieu of the, uh, the killing. So it is not the judge who does the forgiveness. It is the relatives of the dead person who, who exercise their powers to either forgive or to insist that the punishment be carried out. Okay. Now, um, spying. Um, Mustafa, the, the fact is that the Quran prohibits spying explicitly and says that you should not spy on your brother. So if you plant cameras um, with the aim that your roommate has narrowed you, so because your roommate has narrowed you, you are going to plant cameras <laughs> in order to submit it to a Sharia court as evidence of what he was doing when he narrowed you. Um, his lawyer would argue that it constituted spying, and to the extent that the Quran prohibits spying, I'm sure that evidence would not be admissible. Okay. Then, um, human rights. You see, my brother, that's why in answering his question, I emphasized on the word human. Okay? So, as for humans, we shift our definitions and understandings of human rights all through the decades. Right now, the Americans are telling us that uh, LBGTQRC plus is human right. But I'm sure it doesn't make sense to you. They are saying that polygyny is disallowed in America because the consenting adults who have agreed to go into a polygamous arrangement, they don't have human rights. But people who have decided that they will pursue what we believe to be unnatural sexual pleasures is within their human rights to so do. And so I said to him that I, I can only understand the limits of God's law. And we can continue to shift the goalposts as humans to fit our own comforts and whimsical desires. Okay, I am not by any stretch of imagination justifying those whimsical desires because I disagree that LBGTQ plus Y is human rights. I disagree. Big time, I disagree with all the vehemence at my disposal. Are you following me? Uh -huh. So, I am saying therefore that whose who's human rights, when you say human rights, whose rights? Whose rights? American rights? Ghanaian rights. So human rights itself is contextual. What may be human rights to the people of Indonesia will not be human rights to the people of Sapelga, where I come from. I, I, I don't know whether you understand me. So that's why I said to him that it's a difficult question. I'm hard pressed at answering it. So don't, I'm not explicitly saying that 100 lashes of the ship is against human rights. In any event, God is wholly other, other than this earthly realm. So, 
God's law is not human law. I, I don't know whether you understand. And, and so if God's law contradicts human law, farewell and good. I, I, I don't know whether you understand the point. So don't misunderstand me to say that I am saying that 100 lashes of the ship is bad or questioning Allah's judgment. No. Because as for humans, they determine what they want to be right at any point. Do you know that in the 1970s, uh, homosexuality was, was considered a disease in America, that people who were homosexuals, it was classified as one of the medical conditions. And then in the 80s, they expunged it. And then they have come to Africa to say that we should allow people to do that. So as for me, this whole business of human rights, now they say we can't even ship our children. That is not human rights to ship children. Why is it not human rights? What is it? Me, my father, the beatings my father gave me, I'm excited that he beat me. Well, why? Because part of it is the reason I am sitting here today and I am Mustafa Habib. <laughs> you know, my, 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 my wife and then my daughter are in the room. I've been telling them the ordeal that I went through in the hands of my father, which has shaped me. But for that, I will be very wayward because I have very rebellious tendencies. Do, do you we, understand? We hope you've not been beating your daughter, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> On the contrary. Because that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary. We are, she's, in the, she's been born in the age of human rights, so my, my, my hands are tied. Now, the spirit of the Quran. You see, there is a verse in the Quran that says, La yukallifu lahu nafsan illa usaha. That, for me, is the whole principle that animates the Quran is in our affairs to make life easy for people. Look, even this cutting of hands, those who have been to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is a country I haven't visited before because, and I haven't, because I haven't also done the Hajj. But people tell me that in Saudi Arabia, you can drop your bundle of money somewhere and go several miles and come and pick it. Nobody touches it. Because everybody is afraid that if you were to take it, your hands will be cut. Nobody would even pick it to go and give it to an authority to say, oh, keep this. They would just be kicking it until the person comes to pick it. So to that extent, it's made life easier. You can leave your door ajar. People won't come and harass you and so on. So really, I don't know where we have to make the balance between a very permissive society where we are talking human rights and everything is permissible versus applying setting rules um, and ensuring order. I, I don't know whether you understand. When our president said that he wanted to make Accra the cleanest city in Africa, I remember Ambassador, uh, the one who was our ambassador to China. I'll remember his name. He's now Siga, Siga Boss. I'll remember his name. Ambassador Edward Boateng said he met the Rwandan ambassador to China at a meeting in China. And the Rwandan ambassador said to him, your president in Ghana says he wants to make Accra the cleanest city in Africa. And he said, yes. And he said, he can never do so. Ambassador Boateng said initially he was upset. I mean, he was being nationalistic. What do you mean? If you've done it in Rwanda, why can't we do it? And he says, take time, take time. Will you take soldiers onto the streets of Accra to beat people? And he said, eh, in Ghana, we can't do that, though. He says, then you can never make Accra the cleanest city in Africa. He says, in Rwanda, we beat people. We maimed people. We killed others to make Rwanda what it is today. So really and truly, what do we want? Do we want a disorganized, chaotic society, permissive, human rights, 350 radio stations, everybody knows everything, and everybody is talking? Or we want a society of order where rules are applied and applied stringently. Decide, you have chosen permissiveness, human rights, and so on. Country broke or country no broke? All right. So, so, so we're going to take, I, I was going to say something, but I won't say it. I'll say it later on <laughs> after we are done, because we need, to, we need to have a long conversation about some of your thoughts <laughs> and your ideas. <laughs> 
but no, I'm not saying that. Oh no, 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 I get you. No, 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 it's on there. I'm just saying that you need to balance. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you need to balance. All right. Um, so we'll just take the last question, and the last question we have another distinguished personality who is in our midst. Um, she is by the person of Professor Engobo Emese, who is the Dean of the School of Law of the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom, who has joined us this evening for this discussion. Let's give her a round of applause as she asks her question. So, um, the verse that I quoted about half the punishment for a free person is specifically in regard to the punishment for Zena. It's not in regard to any other. Okay? All right. So, that is that. But, I want to make a point that all the cases that you hear, indeed, in the international world, that the, uh, the Taliban's have sentenced somebody to die by stoning, the Sharia courts in Nigeria have sentenced somebody to die by stoning, it's all women. You never hear that a man is sentenced to die by stoning. Now, that is an Islamic. The, the Quran is very egalitarian. Okay? It, and I'm going to quote. Okay? The principle of gender justice as enshrined in Quran 33-35. It says, Verily, the Muslims, men and women, the believers, men and women, the men and women who are obedient to Allah, men and women who are truthful, men and women who are patient, men and women who perform their duties to Allah, men and women who abstain from forbidden acts, men and women who are humble, men and women who give the sadaqah, men and women who observe the fast, men and women who pray the obligational nawafil, men and women who guard their chastity, and men and women who remember Allah much with their hearts and tongues. Okay? It says that Allah has prepared for all of them forgiveness and a great reward. So you see that this verse has gone, has had pains to say men and women, men and women, men and women. The other day I was asking Imam Irbad, he's left. I said, show me any verses in the Quran that are gender exclusive. <laughs> and he says, no, all the verses of the Quran are gender inclusive. So you, what it is is that our patriarchal societies and the Afghan societies, is so deeply, inherently patriarchal 
that they twist these Quranic injunctions to suit their own male chauvinistic views. So what they say is that the reason they are always sentencing only women is that for women, the evidence is normally clear. You become pregnant. So if you become pregnant or so on, they say that that one, they don't need any other evidence. But they say that in the case of the man, it is your word against his word, and you guys have not brought four witnesses to prove that the man engaged in adultery. So that's how come the men are always going scot-free. That's what they say. But it is not the spirit of the Quran. I don't know whether I, 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 I have properly answered your question. In other words, I'm saying that it is a travesty of justice that all the people that you hear have been sentenced to death are women. That is not the spirit of Quranic law. The spirit of Quranic law is gender inclusive. That's the point I'm trying to make. And the evidence is 33-35, Surat al-Ahzab. Are you following the point that I'm making? The, uh -huh. Then there was another question, right? Okay, those were the two questions you asked. So that's it. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mustafa Abdul Hamid. Let's, let's, give, let's do it better. We can do it better for him. It's, it's been an engaging conversation. And on behalf of the Gimper Faculty of Law, I'd like to thank you for honoring our invitation and for delivering this um, particular um, um, lecture or presenting this um, paper um, of yours. Um, our time um, is up. It's already six o'clock. Students have to go for classes. People have to do other things as well. So we'll bring um, proceedings here to an end. There are some refreshments that we have in the foyer. So um, those of you who are interested can um, do that. I also need to remind you that we were being carried live on ABC News TV as well. So ABC News TV carried this um, event live as well. Thank you very much um, for that. So thank you all and have a good evening.